the future of energy supply and demand. Until companies and, and individual households decide how they're going to operate in the future, we won't see what that demand picture will look like. But right now, it looks like there may be some sort of permanent reduction in demand. The future of climate research. I think that's also very important as a scientific organization to keep this independence for uh, scientific quality. And testing the air at 30,000 feet. You might find yourself hunting around for gaffer tape in a country where you don't know how to say gaffer tape. It's Friday the 25th of June and you're listening to Weather Snap from the Met Office. Hello, I'm Claire Nazir and this is Weather Snap the insider's guide to the week's weather headlines. As previously reported on WeatherSnap, renewable energy continues to break records for output and share of the energy supply chain. While early reports of emissions reductions due to COVID showed minimal impacts, as lockdown restrictions continue, and many of us are still working from home, the nature of energy supply and demand is continuing to change. To find out more, I spoke to Fred Brower, senior Met Office account manager working with the onshore energy sector. Throughout the last two springs, and in particular during the, the first lockdown in the spring of 2020, they saw a significant change in the amount of power consumed, and then also a much higher share of renewable power on the grid. Tell me about the year as a whole, that's maybe spring 2020 to spring 2021. What sort of reduction were we looking at in demand? As reported by National Grid, the average amount of power consumption fell by about 20% during the first lockdown. So we had successive lockdowns since then, but people's habits have changed. And we now talk about a hybrid working ethic where people are going into work, but also a mix of staying at home as well. Have you seen any changes in sort of longer term patterns from a consumption perspective, um, I can only go by what National Grid has been reporting, and there has been an overall reduction in demand. We won't really fully understand, I suppose, until companies and, and individual households decide how they're going to operate in the future. We won't see what that demand picture will look like. But right now, it looks like there may be some sort of permanent reduction in demand. Working from home, do you think it's a more efficient way of using energy? Probably not necessarily the most efficient as everybody's working from home. However, when we see national demand dropping, this is what the the devil will be in the detail as things get analyzed, what is causing that and, and what is a more efficient way of operating. We're transitioning to a low carbon economy and Obviously, part of that is the fact that we're heading towards zero coal. Now, coal is only a matter of percentage now when it comes to use. Can you see that being phased out in the next months or years? Coal is being pushed off the grid as we speak. Big six energy companies have largely written coal, I believe, out of their business plans and are mothballing coal-fired power plants. Of course, coal has to be replaced by something, and we're seeing an increase in electricity produced by gas, but also we're seeing a significant increase in the amount of electricity produced by renewable sources. Renewables is the way forward, but on cloudy days where there's no wind, then there is an issue there. And this is where the weather forecast comes into its own, really. It's planning ahead, isn't it? And anticipating these nulls in the weather where the elements cannot produce what we need in terms of energy. Weather is the primary driver in many cases towards predicting demand and generation. This causes high degree of volatility within not only the forecast, but the ability to balance on a minute by minute basis. This causes big problems for national grid network operators and is a big risk when the grid has to also ensure a consistent and secure supply. Fred Brower talking to me earlier. Ahead of the International Climate Conference COP26 in November this year, the Met Office has launched a new climate programme which addresses the key climate issues currently being considered by the UK government. To learn more about the project, I spoke to Professor Albert Kleintank, Director of the Met Office Hadley Centre for Climate Science and Services. 
Albert, in a nutshell, the Hadley Centre Climate Programme, what's new? What can we expect to see? For the new climate programme, it's still essential to maintain the world-leading monitoring capability, the forecasting and the projections of future climate. We clearly see that with the uh, the outside world, climate has really become at the forefront of the political agenda and in, in the societal agenda. Uh, it is really important that we make our evidence and our advice available to society and to government. Is this prescriptive to government and policy or is there a broader remit here with business and industry? Where is your focus? Well, it's foremost to inform the government policy on, on climate and it's not only to mitigate the uh, most uh, severe impacts, but it's also how can we adapt to changes that we already see. We already see changes in climate, for instance, extreme rainfall changing. So we need to adapt to that. What are pathways and what are options for adaptation? Let's talk about the fact that we're integral within government policy because we are a government organisation, but also we have to be independent because we're part of the scientific community. For us, it's really important that we uh, support government and do answer the, the government questions uh, in particular. It's also important that we use uh, what the IPCC has phrased as being policy relevant rather than policy prescriptive. And I think that's also very important as a scientific organization to keep this independence for uh, scientific quality. So COP26 happens in November. Let's talk about the run up to COP, particularly with climate science, as important or more important than perhaps what happens at COP when it comes to the Hadley Centre and climate science. Yeah, the way the Hadley Centre informs governments with the latest scientific evidence, I think the run up to COP is as important as the negotiations itself, where our role will be less uh, visible. In the run-up to COP, it is really advising government with the latest science on how close are we to the 1.5 and 2 degree target, what is the latest on the climate projections. We do contribute to the IPCC reports, which will come out in July, which will also inform the international negotiations. So it is really aligning and making all the latest evidence available also about the local impacts of particular extreme events and how they can be attributed to climate change and to human interference. That's all happening in the run-up to COP. Professor Albert Kleintank. This month, many regions of the globe have had to deal with extremely hot conditions. The Arctic Circle has made headlines yet again with more searing heat. This week, the Moscow Times reported temperatures of 31.1 degrees Celsius in an area called Yakutia, which sits within the Arctic Circle. Whilst 250 miles southwest, the city of Moscow has experienced its hottest June since 1901. Last Monday was the hottest June day ever recorded in Helsinki, Finland, at 31.7 Celsius. June records have also been broken in Mexico, in Mexicali, in Baja California, hitting an incredible 51.4 degrees Celsius on the 18th of June. That's only just below the all-time highest temperature record seen in the country at any time of the year. And just further north, Palm Springs in California, USA, not only matched its all-time highest temperature, it also recorded the warmest June night since records began in North America. So returning to the UK, where are temperatures heading this weekend? Here's Ada McGiven. No temperature extremes expected this weekend and next week for the UK. But there is a warming trend for northern parts of the country. And further south, there'll be further heavy showers at times. Now we start off the weekend with an awful lot of cloud cover. There will be some sunny spells for southeast England as well as the far northwest of Scotland. Otherwise, grey skies for Saturday morning and some low cloud feeding in from the North Sea for eastern parts of Scotland will bring some damp weather here and a few spots of rain also for eastern parts of Northern Ireland. It will brighten up for much of England and Wales and as temperatures rise through Saturday, well, some showers will develop, particularly for southwest England, parts of Wales, the Midlands and East Anglia. These showers will be hit and miss, however, and in between there'll be some sunny spells. It will feel pleasant in the sunshine with temperatures into the low 20s. A cool day, though, further north where we keep largely cloudy skies. But into Sunday, the weather does brighten up for northern parts of the UK, with a greater chance of sunshine coming through, especially to the west of Scotland, as well as Northern Ireland and northwest England. Further south again, and for southern parts of England and South Wales, there'll be some showers from the word go on Sunday, and then perhaps some more persistent rain, especially towards the southwest. And into the start of next week, well, very little changes. It's going to stay largely dry and bright across northern parts of the UK. 
The best of the sunshine will be for northwestern parts, but further south and for southern parts of England, as well as South Wales, the ongoing threat of showers or heavy rain moving up from the continent to bring some particularly wet weather between Monday and Wednesday, perhaps even the odd rumble of thunder as well. And because of that wet weather, temperatures here will be fairly suppressed. Thanks, Aidan. Now here with the figures for last week's highs and lows, Martin Bowles. Here are the weather extremes for last week, observed between Monday the 14th of June and Sunday the 20th of June. The highest temperature of the week was 29.7 Celsius at Teddington in Middlesex on Monday. This is the highest official temperature of the year so far, meaning that 30 Celsius has not yet been reached anywhere in the UK. The lowest minimum temperature was plus 0.4 Celsius at Catesbridge in County Down, Northern Ireland. The sunniest place was RAF Valley in Anglesey, North Wales. 15.1 hours was recorded there on Friday. Heavy rain affected South East England towards the end of last week. The highest daily total measured at Met Office observation sites was 60.8 mm at South Farnborough in Hampshire on Friday. Some Environment Agency measurement sites achieved even higher totals. Earlier this week, the annual International Women in Engineering Day took place, a celebration of work and achievements of women in engineering roles. To mark the event, and as part of our occasional series looking at different roles within the Met Office, today we hear from Dr Kate Speck, an instrument specialist working in atmospheric science. My role entails developing scientific instrumentation, which I primarily use on the FAM, Atmospheric Research Aircraft. So once I've built the instrumentation, I would then use these observations to study atmospheric aerosols and their interaction with sunlight, but also clouds and chemistry. Another aspect of my role is deploying the instruments we build and maintaining those. There are definitely design considerations that come in because we work using an aircraft. A big one is we have to be able to fit it through the aircraft door. So that's one problem that you can run into, uh, slightly narrower than your average household door. We also have a limited power supply. It's only at voltages that an aircraft can generate and it's in limited supply because we work with loads of other instruments on the aircraft at the same time. It has to be safe to operate on an aircraft as well and withstand things like vibrations of turbulence. I never thought in a million years that I would be on an aircraft at, well, a range of altitudes. I think the craziest one is actually we work low level. So flying low level runs over, for instance, sub-Saharan Africa, measuring dust optical properties or over the sea, measuring the properties of the aerosol that comes off the sea. The most enjoyable aspect is going to places you wouldn't choose to go on holiday necessarily. So done field work in Alaska in February, which was cold, Malaysia in July, which was ridiculously hot. To enjoy this, you really have to be completely adaptable. You have to be able to turn your hand to anything, even if it's not necessarily your little area of expertise. So you might find yourself being the person wielding a soldering iron and fixing some electronics, or you might find yourself hunting around for gaffer tape in a country where you don't know how to say gaffer tape. Why should women and girls choose career in engineering? So for me, it's about solving interesting problems. And this includes some really challenging, rewarding projects that can make a real difference to the world in each in their own small way, a good difference in the world. And you get to use really varied and widely useful skills. And you'll find men and women have different skills, different balances. So everyone brings something different to the table, but there's definitely a lot of space for women and girls to come and make a difference in engineering. Instrument specialist, Dr. Kate Speck. Next week sees the latest release of Mostly Climate, our sister series investigating climate science. In this second episode, Presenter Doug McNeil talks to scientist Tim Lenton about tipping points, the mechanisms by which certain elements of the climate may undergo irreversible change. 
Here's Tim explaining what we mean by tipping points and irreversibility. Try to picture two valleys with a hill in between them. Those two valleys represent alternative stable states. And maybe we think of which state we're in as being marked by a ball. The height of the hill between the two valleys can drop and that makes it more and more likely that the ball might roll off into the other valley. That's the so-called tipping point. Once it has rolled off into the other valley, it's not easy to get back. And that's what we mean by irreversibility. We don't really mean it's never, ever going to be possible to get it back, but it means it's hard to get it back. And we'll get it back at a different place in terms of, say, global temperature to where we tipped it over in the first place. As well as outlining the basic concept of climate tipping points, Tim also talks about individual areas of concern. Which ones keep me awake at night the most? In terms of evidence of change that's happening, the biggest alarm bells are ringing in West Antarctica, where we see physical evidence consistent with possibly having passed the tipping point for a reversible retreat of part of the ice sheet that drains over a metre of sea level rise. So it's collapsing slowly now, but the more we warm it up, the faster it collapses, and that one would be very hard to reverse. Professor Tim Lenton and the new episode of Mostly Climate Looking at Climate Tipping Points will be released on Monday the 28th of June. You can find the full episode on the podcast hosting site SoundCloud or at the Met Office Weather Channel on YouTube. That's it for this edition of Weathersnap. I'm Claire Nazir and editor is Adrian Holloway. Weathersnap is a podcast by the UK Met Office.